All right. So the first question that you might want to ask is, what makes an emperor the worst or crazy? And actually, in large part, it's not necessarily bad decision-making um, as a leader. Most of the emperors that we're going to look at today, they're not criticized because of how they managed the empire, even though some of them managed it very, very poorly. They're really criticized for their personal behavior. So I'm going to throw this right out at the beginning. I uh, do not necessarily, I'm not going to weigh my opinion on these guys. I'm giving you guys what ancient authors tell us. So they're not necessarily a bad leader. Many of them were, but not all of them. They are usually young when they take power. A lot of them are under 20. Most of them are under 30 years old. Um, so they're inexperienced, maybe a little headstrong. Uh, imagine if you, right now, were granted the like sole authority and power over all of Europe, right? Exactly. You'd make wonderful decisions, I'm sure. They are often associated with megalomania, what we might call having a god complex. In fact, for the Roman emperors, very literally a god complex. Um, extreme narcissism, and eventually, uh, many of them ended up bankrupting the treasury in pursuit of, you know, aggrandizing themselves in various ways. They have eccentric behavior. Now, remember, again, this is the Romans that are presenting us these biographies. So they like to criticize um, Roman emperors for bad behavior, usually with a sexual spin. So we'll go through some examples. They are prone to paranoia. So a lot of emperors um, believe, and some rightfully so, that there were conspiracy theories against them. And they usually partner this paranoia with lots of executions of family members and other people in power, senators and things like that. And just in general, they've got real murderous tendencies, very prone to violence, um, you know, the sorts of things we might expect. But probably the worst thing is that they were populace who heavily taxed the wealthy. And you just, you just can't do that in ancient Rome, right? I bring that up because our primary evidence for these guys are biographies and histories written by Roman authors. Roman authors are wealthy Roman men. So it's just important to keep in mind, and I'll sort of bring this up as we go through, that the evidence that I'm telling you guys is not necessarily an unbiased or even firsthand account. Many of these authors are writing 80 to 100 to 200 years after the emperor has already been assassinated or killed. And so for some of these emperors, we actually know that the common Roman liked them, um, found them quite popular, but they, for various reasons, um, earned the ire of the elite, of other power players, and thus were taken out. And because they were taken, um, their histories were written by the victors, which means not them. And so this is the perspective that we have. Um, but they're really fun stories, so I'm going to go ahead and share them with you. All right, let's start off. Emperor number one, Caligula. He's actually the third emperor of Rome, only the third emperor. Caligula nickname, it stands for Little Boots, and that's because his dad would take him on military campaigns for him, and so his mom made him little tiny army boots, which is so cute. He reigned from 37 to 41 CE. That's four years. That's not very long. He came into power at 24 years old. We actually hear that his first year was not bad, but during that first year, he got a very serious illness. And after that, he was crazy. And scholars have actually speculated it was maybe literally crazy that whatever illness he suffered in that first year may have caused some 
brain damage that caused him to have um, uh, psychotic tendencies or maybe it elicited a, um, a mental illness. Our sources, again, these guys are writing a lot later, but Suetonius, Cassius Dio, and a guy named Tacitus Annal, uh, Tacitus in his book called The Annal, which uh, lists all the Roman emperors. So what's the evidence for this crazy? You know, I mean, there's like the everyday stuff where he would talk to the moon and like confide in the moon his secrets and his desires, that kind of thing. And of course, then he would turn into a brothel and bring in um, prostitutes and sort of have large parties. Um, along with that sort of sexually deviant behavior, he was rumored to have had a long-standing relationship with his sister, Livia Drusilla. And there was this one time that he built a three-mile long floating bridge across the Bay of Baiae just so he could ride his horse across it uh, because a prophecy told him that he couldn't. So he rode it across, spent and then rode it back across the next day and then destroyed the bridge. Hmm. Cool. And probably most famously is his obsession with his horse. This was brought out last week in our, our lecture on Roman pets. But Caligula is the emperor who had a favorite horse in Kitatus. Uh, he did build the horse a, pa a house and host dinner parties in the horse's name. Um, he uh, made the horse a senator and even joked that he would make the horse a consul. And there's some more evidence. Um, there was that one time that he took an army to the coast of France and said he was gonna sail to Britain to invade Britain. But he ended up not doing that and instead he declared war on the sea uh, against Neptune. Yes, um, I believe they won. They declared victory over Neptune. Um, in terms of murderous tendencies, we start off with his uncle Tiberius. So there's lots of speculation that he suffocated the second emperor um, Tiberius, his uncle, his adopted father, his cousin Tiberius, who was actually his adopted son, uh, also probably killed him, his grandmother Antonia, his father-in-law, his brother-in-law, and then lots of people he wasn't related to. And it's because of these murderous tendencies and sort of bad behavior that a lot of people think that Joffrey from Game of Thrones uh, was cast uh, to look Caligula. So the, the photo on the right there is our Game of Thrones king. And then he, uh, he declared himself a god, you know, as you do. And he said he wanted to move the capital to Egypt uh, where people were accustomed to worship the rulers as gods, and there he could be worshiped as the sun god. And that finally did it for people and he was assassinated by the secret service of the Roman emperors, known as the Praetorian Guard. So he's our first imperial assassination. Moving on, the Emperor Nero, the emperor everybody loves to hate. He actually had a pretty good long run, a 14 year reign. He started at the age of 17, you guys. That's your guys' age. He's the last of our Julio-Claudian emperors. So he's emperor number five, and after him, that first dynasty is done. People say he's actually a decent administrator. Um, so he, he ran the empire pretty well until the end, and then it, it went too far too fast. Uh, he died by suicide, and supposedly his famous last lines, oh, what an artist the world is losing. Again, we have our sources, and they are probably very, very skewed against Nero. Not only was he uh, forced to commit suicide by the Senate, but he's the last of a dynasty. So everybody writing about him is really cutting ties with a whole family of emperors. He is unlucky in love, you guys. He marries this woman, Octavia. And then when he falls in love with another woman, he decides to frame her for committing adultery and has her beheaded. Yikes. 
Then he marries this other woman, Papea Sabina. But his mom doesn't like her. Oh, man. So he does what any boy does when their mom doesn't like their new girlfriend. He tries to poison his mother. That doesn't work. So he rigs the ceiling above her bed to collapse on her and, and crush her to death. But she gets out of the way. So he has his surgery take her on a boat trip and has the boat sink so that she'll drown. Turns out she can swim. So he finally just sends a servant in there to drop a knife in front of her and claim that she was trying to kill her son. And so he kills her in quote unquote self-defense. And then he can marry Papea. Oh, but then they got into an argument, and so he actually kicks Papea to death while she's pregnant with their child. But then he misses her. And so uh, he learns about a woman who looked like her, so he goes and sends for her. But then he finds that there's a boy, a, the son of a freedman, who actually looks like her as well. So he gets that boy and castrates the young man and then treats him like a wife in every way. Uh, yeah. So let's talk about some other evidence for crazy. Nero loved the Olympics. He loved chariot racing and he actually, uh, in one of the Olympic games, he rode his chariot. And he won. It was crazy. I couldn't believe it. He also is very famous for the persecution of Christians. Um, there are very conflicting sources on this. We know that he did persecute Christians. Um, and some sources suggest that he actually was the one that had Peter, the disciple of Jesus, and Paul, the apostle, um, be uh, crucified. He loved to sing. He loved to play the lyre. Um, we hear that he had regular parties where he would force the senators to listen to him. It has been mythologized that he sang during the great fire of Rome or played the fiddle. Um, we don't actually think that's true, but we do know that he forced people to listen to him. And you can see more in the movie Quo Vadis. Now, about that fire, that fire destroyed a huge section of the city of Rome where lots and lots of people live. And while he did help out the people to a certain extent, the main thing that he did was reclaim that land for himself and build a gigantic pleasure palace. This pleasure palace was known as the Domus Aria. This is the Golden House. It was a massive complex that was covered in elaborate frescoes, marble finishings, and of course gold. It had its own little sort of mini pantheon before it, there was the pantheon. Again, like I said, it was massive. It also included a private pleasure lake with a floating palace on it and a colossal statue of himself. Yes. And it was this pleasure palace that was upon Nero's suicide uh, was drained to make way for the Colosseum, which becomes known as the Colosseum because it's the place of the Colossus. Uh, Vespasian and his sons chisel out Nero's face and turn it into a statue of the sun god. We know that the cost of rebuilding and really of building his pleasure palace resulted in huge amounts of money. Um, and so what he would do to get more money is that he would force wealthy people to adopt him and then force them to commit suicide. So he inherited their estate. Fun fact. Um, if you were involved in your parents' murder in Texas, you were automatically w removed from any inheritance. My dad would always tell me that. It's a very strange thing to say. Um, obviously, all of this angered the elite. And so there was a series of rebellions in 68, which resulted 
in uh, Nero being forced to commit suicide to avoid being killed in much more um, diabolical ways. How about Commodus? Commodus came to power at 16 years old. Um, he was the son of Marcus Aurelius, who was a great emperor, but Commodus ruined that for everybody. He loved the arena and he loved himself and he was assassinated. Now, Cassius Dio and Herodian actually lived through Commodus's reign. So these sources are a little bit closer um, as evidence, although they are still very biased. Commodus is probably best known to us through that movie Gladiator, where Joaquin Phoenix plays an imaginative version of the emperor. But the movie does capture Commodus's love for the arena. We hear that um, he loved the arena so much that people speculated that his father was not Marcus, but rather a gladiator that the Empress had slept with. We do know he actually would fight opponents in the arena, but they of course would surrender before ever actually being killed. However, he would take injured people. This is seriously what they say. Um, he would find out limbs, like missing feet or missing legs or missing arms, and he would tie them together and call them giants and then club them to death in the arena. We do know he also fought people in practice matches for smaller audiences in the palace, and those people he did kill. And every time he performed, he charged the city of Rome a million dollars for his services, for his entertainment. So that's a baller move. We also know that he would go in the arena and he would kill lions. In fact, one in one day he killed a hundred lions and the crowd happy. He invented a special kind of arrow that was specifically designed to chop off the heads of ostriches. He killed three elephants in one match and a giraffe. And uh, the people were not happy about these acts of violence against tame animals. But perhaps the craziest thing Commodus does is he dresses up like Hercules and declares himself a god. He regularly is seen wearing the lion's skin of Hercules. Um, he was so godlike, he also renamed the colony of Commodus, but he didn't start stop there. He renamed all 12 months Lucius, Aelius, Aurelius, Commodus, Augustus, Her Herculeus, Romanus, Ex Superatorius, Amazonius, Invectus, Felix, Pius. And what's really interesting is that Commodus's full name happens to be Lucius, Aelius, Aurelius, Commodus, Augustus, Herculeus, Romanus, Ex Superatorius, Amazonius, Invectus, Felix, Pius. What a coincidence. He renames the Roman legion the Commodiani. He renames the Roman fleet, Alexandria, Gianni Togata. He renames the Roman Senate, the Commodian Fortunate Senate. And he does all this, the day that he does all of these wonderful things of renaming, he declared that day, Dies Commodianus. So there you go. Um, upon his assassination, all of these things were changed back. He bankrupted the treasury. He devalued the currency. Worst of all, he overtaxed the wealthy. And so eventually he was killed by his wrestling partner. And last but not least is Elagabalus. This man came to power at just 14 years old and had a long and healthy reign. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. He ruled for four years. He's otherwise known as Heliagabalus because he associated himself and thought himself to be a personification of the sun god, Helios. He also is our first uh, transgender uh, emperor. He regularly uh, is seen in the appearance of a woman. We'll talk about that. And he is quoted saying, call me not Lord for I am a lady. Um, unfortunately, the Romans not progressive in that realm. And so he is murdered by a plot organized by his grandmother. Elagabalus is another one that we have firsthand accounts of his life. These guys are living through his reign. But even better than that, of course, is the archaeology. 
we do have some archaeological evidence of particularly his uh, bringing the sun into Rome and the temple he built for that. So let's look at that crazy. This temple, the sun god, is uh, manifested in a stone. It's a rock. It is just a rock. It is a black stone that he brought over from Syria and built before. And one day a year on the festival, he would put that rock in a chariot and have it parade through the streets of Rome. Cool. Okay. He also had five wives, one of whom, that's right, he had five wives at the age of 14 and he ruled for four years. So there you go. One of whom was a virgin. Now, just so you know, uh, Vestal virgins are not supposed to get married. That's the virgin part. Um, and Roman law would have actually buried them alive had they been proven not to be virgins. Uh, but Elagabalus said, uh, I'm going to pass, and he went for it. But then, not satisfied with those five wives, he also married his favorite charioteer and then declared his charioteer um, a sort of vice president, a Caesar to his Augustus. And he started a long-term relationship with a famous Greek athlete. And this man, he made his sort of um, manager of his affairs, uh, business affairs. We also hear authors tell us that he regularly wore wigs, uh, makeup, he plucked all the hair from his body, and he preferred to be referred to as lady or queen. And Iocassius actually tells us that he asked the physicians to contrive a woman's vagina in his body by means of an incision, promising them large sums of money for doing so. So he's our earliest example of sort of transgender behavior um, at, the, at the highest levels of Roman society. In addition to all of these things, we hear many stories about him also turning the palace into a brothel um, for serving in the role as a prostitute and many other sexually deviant behaviors. So uh, he ends up being beheaded along other by the Praetorian Guard. Their bodies are thrown into the Tiber River and his grandmother, who sort of orchestrated the whole thing, decides to put his cousin on the throne in his place. Now, just as a quick, we have two runners up here. Um, of course, Domitian, uh, the Aspasian. He may have killed his brother Ty Titus. He was prone to extreme paranoia, executed lots of senators, some cousins, creative torture practices, did bury a Vestal Virgin alive, and demanded to be worshipped as a god. He was assassinated by a palace slave, orchestrated by his wife. Now Caracalla, he reigned from 211 to 217, the emperor right before Elagabalus, and he definitely killed his brother. He wanted to be Alexander the Great. And when a bunch of people put on a play that made fun of him in the city of Alexandria, he slaughtered all of the leading citizens and then let his army loot the city for four days. He was assassinated by his Praetorian guard and soldiers. So my question to you guys is who is the craziest emperor? Is it Little Boots Kalu or crazy singing Nero, Hercules gladiator fighting Commodus, or five wives are not enough Elagabalus. <laughs>